exactly the same thing. Um, the AM is still, I think it's still going to be what it was. The FM has been switched over to a Southern Gospel channel now. 107.9. 107.9. And uh, um, one of the DJs, I listened to him, and he did a good job. A um, longtime friend of mine, and uh, I thought he did a great job. And so uh, if you get an opportunity, uh, if you like more Southern Gospel Quartet, that type of singing, um, give it a shout. It, it's a good channel, 107.9. Okay? All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13. How, have you ever heard someone say in regard to someone else, um, I'd like to buy that person for what they're worth and sell them for what they think they're worth? Anybody? Yeah, a lot of you. It, it describes a person who is normally arrogant, egotistical. It reminds me of, a, of an old song, many, many years ago, an old country song, Mac Davis. The course, and I'm not going to tell you the whole course because the language... But the course goes, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. And it goes downhill from there. Does, does the Bible address this kind of behavior? Actually, it does. What do you think of as far as a fill in the blank? You've just got to look out for number one, right? Sounds very common. What about this one? You've got to learn to toot your own horn. Then there's this one. I've got to do what's best for me. I like this one. It's expensive, but I'm worth it. And that seems to be so much of society today. What does the Bible say? Verse 4, just one verse. 1 Corinthians 13. Charity, and the word there is love. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Now, Last part. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Arrogance. Someone who's egotistical. I want to think tonight on this subject how to deflate an inflated ego. How to let the air out of a puffed up ego. As Christians, we should never 
ever have that attitude. Let me give you three reasons why, quickly. First of all, because of what it indicates. It's indicative of a couple of things. Number one, it shows just how little we know about the Spirit of God. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, Jesus said this, referring to the Holy Spirit, He said, when He, He's a person, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He shall not speak of Himself, but He shall glorify Me. When we are puffed up, that was Paul's word to the Corinthians. And (laughs) there was a lot of it in that church. When we are puffed up, we have a very, very poor understanding of the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus said in those verses, When He, the Spirit of truth, and if you'll look, even in your King James, New King James takes care of it for you, but even in the King James, if you look, you'll see a capital S, which refers to the Holy Spirit. When He, the Spirit of truth, is come. Now, we talk about the Godhead a lot. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All are God. But yet they are only one. One God manifested in three persons. God the Father is a person. God the Son is a person. God the Holy Spirit is a person. You hear someone say every now and then, Well, I hope the Holy Spirit, I hope it comes tonight. That would be like referring to a friend and not calling them by name or not speaking of them as a person. It would be referring to them as an it. No. It would be good to say we pray that as we meet tonight, that the Holy Spirit, He would come and dwell among us. So God the Father is all-powerful. God the Son is all-powerful. God the Holy Spirit is all-powerful. Yet, Jesus said, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will not speak of Himself. That's just incredible. But he will glorify me. Does does that mean the Holy Spirit becomes subservient? That he's less? No, absolutely not. There is no such thing as great and less in the Godhead. They are all superior but that is within the will and plan of God if if the God had operated like a lot of businesses today and a lot of other things in society God the Holy Spirit would say well I'm not going to give glory to him I deserve glory myself no No. When He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will not speak of Himself. He will not glorify Himself. He will glorify me. So, 
it indicates just how little that most people understand in regard to the Holy Spirit of God. Here's the second thing. It also shows how little that we know about the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign, which means from one aspect, God is over and above all. But it also breaks down into a lot of other points that God calls his own shots. God does his own will. God makes his own plans. And whether man approve of them or not doesn't really mean anything because God is sovereign over all of the universe. And it would indicate when a Christian is puffed up or arrogant or egotistical, it would indicate that they really know very little about the sovereignty of God. It's a great verse. It's also in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6. Paul said this, I have planted, Apollos watered, here it is, but God gave the increase. Verse 7, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. I know this appears to be judgmental. But I am fearful that there are a number of pastors or church leaders, evangelists, even church members who have a poor understanding of this. Anytime you ever see a person involved in ministry which endeavors to bring attention to themselves, what they have done. Now, there's nothing wrong with reporting we do to our association. Baptism, there's nothing wrong with that. Those are praise items. There's absolutely nothing wrong with sharing with someone else. We had two people saved Sunday. Nothing wrong with that. That gives glory to God. And it's a testimony that God is still at work. And in the world today, it's easy to fall into a place where we think nothing happens anymore. Nothing in the church. It does. It does happen. We don't always hear it, but it does. There's nothing wrong with being thankful to God for that. But if the intent is to bring attention to some church leader for what they have done, that's totally different. And it's what Paul was talking about here. He said, I planted, but I was moved on by the Holy Spirit somewhere else. I planted Apollos, another church leader, Apollos watered. What Paul had planted, Apollos watered. But Paul is not attempting to bring the attention to himself or Apollos. He said, it is God who giveth the increase. So his conclusion was, Neither is he that planteth anything. He's talking about himself there in that context. Neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. 
if, if we are puffed up, arrogant, egotistical, it indicates some things about us that are not good. Certainly not scriptural. What it indicates. Second, what it insinuates. Second word. If you think about it, an inflated ego implies that someone is better than someone else. If I have a puffed up ego, and that shows, people pick up on it. So much that there's even talk. I visited that church, and I, I got the impression the whole time I was there that the pastor wanted to be center stage. He wanted everything to involve around him. So in essence, if that happens, that pastor or that leader, whatever it is, is insinuating that they are better than other people. And that should never be. Because when that happened, it tears down, breaks down the worth of other people. I've said this for years, and I don't think every one of them did this intentionally. But it was something that I remembered from my childhood days growing up in church. And I don't ever remember going before the Lord and making a valve and saying that. No. It was just something that was there. And when God called me to be a pastor, it was one of those things where I said, I don't want to do that. I can remember many times listening to pastors when I was a boy. And it was almost like they gave off the assumption that they never sinned. Never. That they lived this perfect life. Some of y'all may have sat under something like that. And I remember what an effect it had on me. Even after I was saved, I remember thinking, how come I'm still tempted? Evidently, that pastor is never tempted. Now, in reality, I know that he was. But I've always tried to be honest with the congregation. And to just tell the congregation right up front. The struggles that you go through. The temptations you go through. I go through them as well. And by the way, temptation, being tempted is not sin. You understand that? It becomes sin or is not sin based on how we respond to it. That's the key. The Lord Jesus Christ was tempted, and He knew no sin until He became sin, and that wasn't His. That was mine and yours. When... When we are puffed up, if we are arrogant, and I think this is particularly important if we are in a place of leadership, 
I think we insinuate, although it can be just members, I think we are insinuating that we are better than someone else. I don't want to ever do that. That is not agape love. Agape love is sacrificial. It's always considerate of other people. What happens if a Christian becomes puffed up? It's wrong because of what it indicates. It's wrong because of what it insinuates. One more. Also because of what it interrupts. Because it has to do with relationships. We're going to talk about two of them in closing. First, it disrupts, and this is the most important one, it disrupts our relationship with God. If we are puffed up, if we are arrogant, if we are egotistical, it will affect, disrupt our relationship with God. You know what's really at the heart of a person who has an inflated ego? Now when I tell you, you'll know. Pride. Pride. Pride is at the very heart of someone who has an inflated ego. And by the way, I said a moment ago that it affects or disrupts our relationship with God. Pride is something God hates. He really does. Now, obviously, pride is one of those things that's not always bad. Pride can be good. There are things it's okay. I think there are things we should be proud of. If God has brought us into a congregation where we feel comfortable, where we feel like we can worship God, I think we ought to be proud. Proud of that congregation. Proud of God's people. Are they perfect? No. No. That's a wholesome pride. That's okay. When your children, when your grandchildren do something, um, when they graduate, when something happens, it's okay to be proud of them. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But that isn't the pride that God hates. James said this, God resist us the proud do you realize that if you're going against God head on that you're always going to lose if you're going depending on your own resources you're going to knock God off of the footstool you're going to lose every time and when it says God resisteth, it means there's no way you can win. That's the pride that God hates. The wise man Solomon may be one of the greatest verses of all. Pride goeth before destruction. Yeah. And a haughty spirit and that's what the ego is about. A haughty spirit before a fall. And by the way, that verse, that spirit is a little less. It's the spirit of man. Pride goeth before destruction. 
we've been studying in Sunday school, just going through the Old Testament. And we're in Second Kings now. And there are so many times that we will read of another king and it says they did what was right in the sight of God. But there are many, many more that it says they did what was evil in the sight of God. And guess what? In the end, it led them to destruction every single time. And it would have a catastrophic effect on Israel and Judah, both. So, pride will interrupt or disrupt our relationship with God. One more. It will also disrupt our relationship with others, with other people. Again, Solomon said this, Proverbs 13. He said, by pride cometh contention. That, that indicates strife, trouble. Trouble between people. Pride will lead to contention. I heard a story that I think illustrates this so well. A young preacher just beginning ministry had gone off to school gotten his education. Nothing wrong with that. That's wonderful. He came back to his home church. The pastor invited him to preach. When he got up after he was introduced and went up to the pulpit, in his heart was arrogance. He even looked down at his former pastor. I'm educated. I've been to seminary. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying anything wrong with it. If it affects us in an adverse way, it's wrong. He walked up to the pulpit and full of arrogance. He made the awfulest mess in the world. Nothing wasn't working. His mind wasn't working. I think he probably went about 10 minutes and decided that's enough. He just wasn't there. He folded his Bible, turned the service back over to the pastor, went back and sat on the front pew, and he was so dejected. He was broken. An elderly lady in the church who had knew him since he was a kid went up to him and put her arm around him. She said this. She said, young man, if you had gone up the way you came down, you would have came down the way you went up. He went up full of pride. He came down broken. She was saying, if you would have went up broken, 
you would have came down. Blessed of God. A lot of wisdom in that elderly lady. It's, there's always there's always temptations for our pride, for our ego to go to places it should not go. Let's stay humble before God. Let's be people of humility. And I didn't bring this because I knew somebody in the church. No, no. This is just something that we need to keep in mind. That's why I call it how to deflate an inflated ego. Let's stand.